Hello everyone, welcome to the 19th episode of uh, Math and Beyond and then this podcast. Today we are talking with uh, Alicia Castro. Uh, she's a, a PhD student in uh, theoretical physics at uh, Radwood University in the Netherlands. And she is researching uh, in quantum gravity, which is the our topic of uh, discussion. So I'm going to send uh, the invite and uh, I will see you shortly. Hi. Hi, Alicia. Hi, how are you? Oh Sorry, it was very loud and you scared. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how are Another you? Oh, I'm dead. I'm very tired. <laughs> Why? Uh, so right now we have a conference and I was I was just organizing a session uh, right okay. before this. Yes. Okay. Where, uh, where is uh, the conference? It's actually Quantum Gravity 2023. Okay. So, uh, okay. We, are, we are on track. Great. Yes, exactly. It's great because I can just keep talking about what I was just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Where, where, where are you at the moment? In the in Radboud University in Nijmegen. Okay. okay. Are, are you in the Netherlands too? Yes, I am in Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah. And uh, okay. I, gave, I gave a small introduction uh, before about you and, um, and it said that you have, as you just said that, that you are in Radwood, you are doing your PhD um, study uh, at Radwood University in theoretical physics. And um, yeah, pre previously you have been uh, also to various, uh, let's say, well-known uh, institutes uh, as uh, the Perimet Institute, uh, the Institute of Harry Poincaré, and um, also you have been a visiting researcher at the University of uh, Southern California. So a lot of uh, experience, I, I, would, uh, I would say. But, and today the topic of discussion, uh, as you said, indeed was uh, quantum gravity, as I introduced, which is, uh, uh, let's say, heated subject, uh, I guess, uh, today uh, within the physics uh, uh, field. And we are happy to, we are very much happy to dig into it uh, with you. So I would say that we can uh, uh, start delving okay. into it. Great. And I would like to ask you, probably if people are watching uh, uh, here, are watching this, this episode, uh, they probably know what quantum mechanics is about. They probably know what general relativity is about. We know that uh, there is uh, some uh, problem that these two theories uh, explain a huge amount of phenomena but together they are incompatible. They do, cannot work uh, together. So why do we need uh, basically a theory of uh, quantum gravity, meaning uh, what are the phenomena which made us tell, uh, okay, quantum mechanics and general relativity do not, work, do not work well together? Yes, exactly. So as you said, if you just consider these the two theories, quantum theory or quantum field theory and gravity or general relativity, in principle, there is no reason why they would need to be compatible because quantum theory applies to very small particles in a very energetic regime. And gravity applies to well us every day, very big planets to our whole universe, right? Uh, and I actually had this question, uh, well, this discussion with one of my teachers when I was doing my bachelor's because he was like, well, Alicia, why do you want to do quantum gravity? I mean, we already know what quantum gravity is. You just put together quantum theory, GR, and it turns out you cannot predict anything. That's quantum gravity. And well, <laughs> if we didn't have a scenarios in our universe that would actually ask for us to put this together, then it would make no sense to be looking for a quantum theory of gravity. But the fact is that there are two very important scenarios. So some years ago, we just took the first picture of a black hole. And we have also detected gravitational waves. And what these two things are telling us is that black holes exist. Now, one can take just, uh, well, general relativity and solve for a black hole. But it turns out that very close to the center of a black hole, our equations break. We don't know what's happening. There is no predictivity there. So if black holes exist, what's 
what is the interior of a black hole and what happens in particular very close to the center. The other scenario is actually even more important for us. It's about the creation of our universe, the Big Bang. So if we take our universe like it is nowadays, we put the equations that know that rule the evolution according to gravity, and then we move uh, time backwards and we go to time equals zero, it turns out that a very similar, uh, we find a very similar scenario to what happens in the center of black holes. We find out that our uh, equations don't work anymore. The equations of uh, Einstein don't work anymore. So we actually cannot do any predictions. And this is even more important because, well, if you don't know what happened at the beginning, then how do we then construct the evolution of the whole universe on top of that? Okay. But can I ask you, when you say that we lose predict predictability, yes, when we lose predictability, predictability mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the center of a black hole and uh, at uh, let's say the moment of our creation, uh, um, usually in uh, when I when I read about it, uh, uh, people mean that uh, in Einstein field equation uh, there are infinities uh, popping out. But mm -hmm. what are the infinities popping out? What is the physical quantity? Yeah. The physical quantity the, that's, that is infinity. The physical quantity that is infinity is curvature. Okay. So the curvature of space time. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have, of course, uh, there are things that, that can diverge, but then you can cure by finding a, a way, well, I did something wrong by assuming these things. We, I did something wrong by, well, my coordinates, my, the choice that I made. But these two singularities in the curvature, we have not been able to get rid of them in any of these ways. OK, OK. Uh, the solution um, so that people say is, um, well, we need to, con because uh, we have to start from the, let's say, the very beginning of uh, the quantum, uh, let's say our quantum revolution. Uh, we introduce quantum mechanics. Uh, we then uh, quantize every known uh, force from uh, electroman electromagnetic force, weak, uh, strong nuclear force. And then we are struggling indeed uh, to quantize gravity. And that's what people say, okay, we need uh, to quantize gravity, but what, what does it mean to quantize uh, gravity? Well, <clears throat> so there's a, so gravity is sourced. The source of gravity is actually whatever thing in the universe that has energy or mass, right? We feel gravity because we have mass, so we are attracted to the planet. And we ourselves and everything that we see around us is made out of particles. And these particles actually at the fundamental level, they are very small, they are very energetic, so they obey the laws of quantum mechanics. So the, the question of quantum gravity or quantizing gravity starts from there just from the fact that, well, we feel gravity, but we're made out of quantum particles. How do these two actually interact to, to well, to make the, 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 the universe that we see every day? So that's one of the reasons to quantize gravity. And of course, uh, another reason is that, well, if wherever we see singularities or wherever we see things that we cannot predict, and they include very high energy, uh, very high energies, and they include like very deformed space time or very, uh, very strong gravitational fields. That's also what we call quantum gravity. We hope that quantum gravity will solve these problems. Okay, but when we say, uh, let's say, quantizing a, a, a fundamental force, so we mean uh, that we basically we are explaining that force. Uh, at a very tiny level. Yes. Okay. And let's say, what is going wrong with quantizing uh, gravity? Or at least, uh, let's start firstly from uh, uh, specifying uh, how are we planning, uh, or how are we doing uh, in quantizing uh, gravity? What are we trying? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first thing that one can try is to quantize gravity in the same way that, as you said, that we have quantized everything else in our, in our model of particles, right? So we can talk about, for example, the electromagnetic field. 
we have been seeing light since, well, before we developed science, uh, we didn't know what it was. And then we did some experiments, very, uh, well, people with very deep ideas came out with the idea that, well, maybe it was a particle, maybe it was a wave. Then we developed electromagnetism and it explained, well, well that light is actually just a wave of some field, of some electromagnetic field. Then quantum theory came, and then we took what we knew, that classical, if you want, or pre-quantum notion that we had of light, and then we could apply some techniques to quantize that field, to quantize this thing that we were seeing every day. And that's what led to something called QED, quantum electrodynamics. So uh, we took something classical, something pre-quantum, and quantized it in a way that well, was consistent enough for us. And that actually works for when you're doing experiments, when we're doing LHC experiments, we can actually measure exactly the numbers that our theory predicts. That's how we know that we did actually the right mathematical procedure to quantize this force. Now, for gravity, what you can do is that, well, we know what classical gravity looks like. Newton told us something, then Einstein improved it. So now we have a theory of general relativity. What if we apply the rules, the mathematical procedure that we have applied for every other force in the universe to quantize it and to arrive to some, some theory that is gonna give us predictions for the universe. And when you do that, it turns out that, well, it is not consistently possible up to very, very uh, small distances. And what happens is that every time that you go to a smaller and smaller distance, you need to add more and more parameters to your theory and it, turn, it and it never stops so if we say okay i want to describe gravity up to the scale of one millimeter we can do that but if you say i can i can understand i, I want to understand gravity as a quantum theory up to any scale the full theory that I could zoom in and zoom in more and more and know what happens, that is uh, where the infinities come out. Okay. So I think this, uh, uh, from here, we can start uh, on to, let's say, delving some of the methods, uh, some of the, yeah, some of the methods that we should be, uh, if we ever want to develop a theory of quantum gravity, then we have to <laughs> keep this in mind uh, um, <laughs> for, the, for our theory. And I want to start from um, the, so-called graviton. Uh, what, is, what is a graviton? Why, what properties uh, does it have? And why did it arise uh, in the first place? Yeah. So going back to what I was saying about the electromagnetic field, right? This is like the, the safe space that we can always go back to make our, our analogies uh, because this is a theory that works very well. So you had a field, the electromagnetic field, uh, and then when you quantize it, it turns out that where there's actually the, a duality or it can also be described in terms of particles of excitations, like fundamental excitations of this field. The fundamental excitations of the electromagnetic field are photons. So are these particles that carry light. So they are, as I said, fundamental excitations of this field. So now if we have gravity, we feel the, the gravitational field every day. That's what uh, Newton told us uh, with our uh, force law. Uh, then one can, when one tries to quantize gravity, then you're gonna get some fundamental excitations of this gravitational field that then you can interpret as particles. And this particle is called the graviton. So a graviton, you should think about it in the same way as you think about a photon. It's just a quanta or some, the fundamental measure of, uh, of the gravitational field. And this is different. Well, now we, we think about it the same way as the photon, but it's actually a bit different because gravity has a bit more degrees of freedom. So it's actually uh, not what we call a spin one particle as a photon, but it's actually a spin two particle. So it just means that it has more degrees of freedom. And this, the fact that it has more degrees of freedom actually make it a lot more intricate to, to work with. Um, and 
you asked me uh, why we need it. Yeah, what yeah, what properties and then why let's say why did it arise in the first place? Uh, how did we ever uh, <laughs> propose that there was such a thing as a graviton? Yeah, so that's what we were hoping to get, right? If one takes a field and one quantizes it, we were hoping that the same as with the electromagnetic field was going to happen. So instead of a photon, we were going to get a graviton. And that's why we named it a graviton. But since that didn't work, so when we tried to do this mathematical procedure, it didn't work. Actually, nowadays, well, we could still argue what a graviton is, because a graviton is what we should get as a quantum fundamental a particle for a quantum theory of gravity, but we don't have a quantum theory of gravity yet. But why, why, why does it not work? What, let's say, what problems are we having uh, with it? Well, uh, the problem is that we don't know how to formulate such theory such that we can make predictions. And if you cannot have the mathematical formula, a consistent mathematical formulation of this theory, then you cannot define exactly what a graviton is because you would need the theory. You would need to analyze what are the fundamental waves or fundamental excitations of this field that involve quantum mechanics. And uh, then that's what you would define as a graviton. OK. OK. And instead, I, I would like now to uh, go on to the point that you touched uh, before, the fact that uh, you said, um, if I want to zoom in uh, 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 on a tinier and tinier and tinier uh, chunk of space, uh, and I would like to understand what, how gravity works uh, in the tiny little chunks of, of space, uh, the deeper I go, the smaller I go, the uh, more parameters uh, I need. This is, uh, I, I think, uh, correct me, correct me, if I'm wrong, is the problem of uh, renormalization, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Can you um, basically <laughs> elaborate on uh, how does, uh, uh, let's say, the pro this problem uh, arise uh, in our theories uh, of, uh, yeah, quantum gravity? And what's the difference uh, with the other the with the quantum field theories, which work smoothly, they work well, uh, but for some reason we do not have uh, the same uh, outcome in our theory of quantum gravity? Yes. Uh, so, again, let's go back to electromagnetism, QED, because that's what we know very well. So, uh, when you want to make a prediction, so you have your, your equations, and uh, you have to set uh, a, a, a energy, an energy where you want to make your experiments. You give me the energy, you give me the charge of the particles that you're interested in, and then I can compute the the probability that this process is possible so for example what's the probability of two electrons going to two photons well that that's actually zero <laughs> uh, but but that's what we can do we can take some uh, numbers uh, we can uh, take our our equations and then we can give you some probabilities so now what happens with electromagnetism is that well you can give me a problem and you can give me an energy scale. And then I can, uh, for that energy scale, there's gonna be some things that I can disregard because they happened at much higher energies. So it's practically the probability that they happen is practically zero. And then I can compute all of the different processes that can actually happen. So for example, an electron and an anti-electron uh, going, uh, they came into a photon. I can count all of them. I can consider all of these processes that can happen at that energy scale. And, and then I can, I, I, and I can give you a probability that that's, that process is going to happen. What happens in gravity is that you cannot do this differentiation. So if you give me an, an energy scale, I cannot count how many of these processes are allowed because given an energy scale, so for example, uh, one giga electron volt, I will always have processes at higher energies that are actually gonna affect what I am computing, the probability that I am computing. So the probability that those things happen is non-zero and they are infinitely many. 
infinitely many of these processes or of, of these Feynman diagrams that are going to contribute to what I am uh, what I am computing. So and I, and I have no control of them. So that's what it, this means that the theory is non perturbatively renormalized. Uh, sorry, perturbatively non renormalizable. Okay. okay. So that we need infinitely many, as you said, there are infinitely many processes, and we need uh, then infinitely many parameters uh, to describe exactly. what it, it, uh, it has infinite. Uh, is it right to say that it has infinite uh, degrees of freedom? Uh, no, that there are infinitely many processes or yeah. or interactions that contribute to a certain okay. energy scale. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. That sounds already enough uh, to stop here, but we have to keep on going uh, <laughs> because yeah. we have many problems, uh, many other problems, uh, and uh, the other the other problem, which is um, uh, which I have been uh, uh, hearing uh, today at a at a seminar here in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. uh, is the problem of uh, uh, non unitarity. Uh, we have uh, this bad uh, beast uh, that uh, let's say. <laughs> messes up uh, with our probabilities uh, uh, at uh, quantum gravity scales. Uh, what is uh, non-unitarity? Why is it a problem? How does it arise? Yeah, so uh, unitarity, so that's something that we think that we propose that our universe should be. So there's a, if this is if this rule that we want our universe to follow, it's not just because we want it, just because we came up with it, but it's because we exactly believe in probability theory. So we believe that, well, if you tell me what's the probability that I'm going to go out and be hit by a car, I can actually predict that. I can give you a number. And for that for fundamental physics, that is what is called unitarity. So we want to assign a number. If you tell me, uh, I will make an experiment in the LHC, and uh, and well, and I will make two protons uh, hit each other. What's the probability that I will get an electron or a thousand electrons? And that I can, the fact that I can give you a number for that, then that is what's called unitarity. And as you can see. Uh, well, and, and that that number is going to be actually a probability of what's going to happen. And the fact that, well, in quantum gravity, if, if quantum gravity is not going to, is not going to give you a probabilistic interpretation of the world, then that's one of the, of the ways in which you can think that, well, maybe quantum gravity is non-unitary. Uh, it also, well, it, it also has to do with, with evolution in time. So in quantum mechanics, unitarity is very tightly linked to, to time evolution. So that means that uh, probabilities are going to be preserved in time or that you can actually evolve consistently some, uh, some states. So again, thinking about two protons that are going to collide in the LH thing, and that, well, you want to know the probability of, of laying a certain number of particles. That just means that you can actually, with your equations, with the math that you know, you can actually evolve the state of two protons, make them interact, take into account all of the considerations, and you can arrive to a late time, uh, to a late time answer that is going to have, well, some electrons there, and you can compute this, this probability. So the fact that we cannot, well, as I said, that, that we cannot even consistently quantize gravity or we cannot consistently do this, think about this process of two gravitons interacting and giving you something else. That is what raises the question about unitarity in quantum gravity. Okay. But what is that goes wrong, uh, let's say, probabilistically speaking, uh, in, quantum, um, in the quantum interpretation? Uh? Of gravity, do we have uh, I don't know, for example, negative probabilities or probabilities adding to more than one? What's uh, specifically that gets? I would say, yeah, I guess messed well, up. Yeah, yeah. In, in this case, uh, of what we're describing, so so unitarity, what well, the breaking of unitarity has a lot of different interpretations. But in this line that we're following about the well, more quantum field theory and quantizing gravity in this way, well, the fact is that you cannot compute probabilities. 
for yeah. a quantum theory of, of gravity in this way. So that's what's telling you, well, then you cannot check for unitarity, right? If you're getting infinities, then well, uh, what happened there? Okay, okay. And you, I, I would like now to make a, let's say a little uh, step uh, forward to connect it, what you just mentioned about uh, um, the evolution in time of our, our system. And I would, I, would, I would like to ask you, how do we reconcile time uh, between quantum mechanics and general relativity? Because uh, uh, quantum mechanics deals with time as a, let's say, independent background, meaning mm -hmm. a background that just is there, is fixed, is absolute, and things uh, happens along it. But sort of uh, like a Newton description. But general yeah. relativity told us, uh, special relativity before, and then uh, general relativity tells us that uh, time is relative. It's not absolute. Is uh, anything else uh, other than being uh, a fixed uh, background. So this, uh, for sure, clashes uh, between each other. How do we fix that? Uh, how do we can reconcile the concept of time? Yeah, so uh, first I would like to comment that, well, uh, the, again, there are different definitions of what time is. So, <laughs> so what, what is, I what want to start definition? with. What do you think is the most yeah. accurate uh, definition? So, uh, so first, what I, what I always do is, okay, let's go as mathematical as possible so that I okay. cannot be vague about anything, right? So okay. uh, we, what I can tell you is that we live in a four-dimensional universe. And as you can see in your everyday life, we have three directions of space and one direction of time. I can move however I want in space. I can move in all three directions, but I can never, I, I, I am forced to always be moving in time. And I am, all, I, I am forced especially to always be moving in one direction of time. It would be great to move in the other one, but uh, we cannot move in another direction of time. So. What that means at, uh, at the mathematical level is that, well, we, we actually don't live in a, well, so, sorry for the mathematical term, but we don't live in a Riemannian manifold, but we live in a Lorentzian manifold. That just means that there is a, there is mathematically a different direction uh, where we measure things. Uh, so that's, that's a very precise uh, definition of what time is. But yeah. of course, uh, for particles and for us, so and what you were just saying that time is relative, that is true because, well, what now, now what Einstein told us is that actually, uh, well, our directions of time are not absolute, right? So we learned in school that you can actually have your x, y, and z axis. And then you can do some transformations, you can change from, uh, from, uh, Sorry, for Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates to spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates. So all of these transformations, I mean, they are just what they what they seem like. They they are just math games. So uh, they shouldn't affect the actual physics that we feel. If I, as my my teacher used to say, if I hit you in the face, that is something that is it you will feel it it doesn't matter if we are in cartesian coordinates uh, in any other coordinates so coordinates are just some mathematical thing that we can play with but there are forces or things that we can actually feel that they should be invariant under this so now the direction of time is like well the other that the x y and z coordinates that we can actually well mix with all the other coordinates and get something something different but of course, what, what a particle feels or what we feel in our everyday life is that, well, there's some direction that, we, that is special from all the others. And this, this direction is the one that we use as a parameter in our equations, in classical equations to evolve things. And this is very natural because that's the way that we experience the world. So this is this time direction or this direction where you cannot just move freely in. So this is very physical. I mean, and, and we see it already in, in, well, in classical mechanics, right? Like this is the direction that you use to, to, well, to throw 
something uh, to, to evolve your equations when you throw something with an initial velocity from an initial position and you want to predict where it's going to end. And that's also, this direction was also considered special in quantum mechanics because, well, that's, that's the notion that we had before Einstein came to with, with general relativity. Uh, so it is a very convenient way of parametrizing everything that we see without thinking about gravity. But when gravity comes in, then again, like the, we understood that actually coordinates or this choice of what direction is what, it's actually, well, shouldn't be physical. It's actually just something, it's a mathematical artifact of the way that we have been describing things. And of course, then the question is, well, how do we reconciliate this, this symmetry or this fact that we can change coordinates with our everyday experience and what all the physics that we have developed before. Uh, so one of the ways uh, that, that, well, I could say two of them. Some people believe that, well, there's actually a preferred direction in the universe. And that's the direction of time. So what the symmetry that Einstein said that was, well, the, the general symmetry of the universe that you can actually exchange X by Y, Y and Z and Z and time, it's actually broken. And that time is special by nature, that, uh, that it's a special uh, direction and that we shouldn't consider them like mixing with the spatial direction. Another way, is to say, okay, our universe is not just coordinates, right? Our universe is not just mathematics, but it has matter on it. It has us on it. So how can we define a notion of time that is consistent with the physics that we know that we have worked out before, but that is actually not attached to any coordinates? That is not attached to a mathematical choice, but it's actually attached to some matter system. So there is people working in how to define time as some parameter, as some matter, and, and, and try to construct uh, relational, uh, relational quantities in our universe. So I can give you an example. So I am uh, 20 years old compared to or in the reference system of a particle that is traveling with certain velocity in Andromeda. So always relating, having coming some, yeah, yeah, yeah. So some, uh, some clock, but a clock that it's matter itself. That is not just this mathematical definition of time as a direction in our four dimensional universe. Okay. Don't you find weird that the only force that we cannot fully explain, which is gravity, um, is tied to the dimension of our manifold, of our space-time manifold, which is, uh, let's say, the least uh, explainable, or let's say, the least, um, let's say, modifiable. Okay, because you can, as you said, I can move uh, uh, in space, uh, but I can choose where to move in space, but I cannot choose where to move in time. I can only move forward. Don't you find that gravity and time being so linked uh, is actually pretty weird? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is also what we believed for almost, well, for more than 2,000 years, right? That... Uh, that time is something special. Time is, uh, well, we don't, you didn't even think about it as a direction in some space time or in some manifold, right? But that was just our, cl our clocks, our watches, like that was what time is. And space is something, well, more, more free. Um, so, I mean, it, it shouldn't be that weird because we constructed our logic and we constructed our way of thinking based on that right it had to einstein well or, or all the, the people that developed general relativity had to come and tell us that there is actually a consistent 
way of understanding our universe where there is no definite direction of time, where time looks a lot like the other directions. It looks a lot like space. It's still a bit different. It's, it's not the same, but that both space and time could be described in some in some uh, in in just one entity, space time. So we shouldn't be like separating them from from before. Uh, and and the thing is that when when one does that, of course, you can ask, well, why do you do that? Why didn't you just ignore Einstein, right? <laughs> I mean, this is a very weird idea. Well, the reason why why we believed him is because when you do this, when you put space and time in the same in the same plane, is when you can actually describe first gravity as not as a force or as some mysterious thing that pulls us to the earth, but actually just as curvature, as a, as curvature of space time, right? So, well, it turns out that, well, there, there's not this mysterious force, but there's actually just curvature in space time in the whole four dimensional manifold. Uh, and, and that's what we feel in our everyday life as, 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 as a force. And also, uh, what I have been telling you about this, uh, the quantization of not just gravity, but of, of, but of electromagnetism and all of the other forces in our universe, we have actually been doing that using the fact that we don't have space and time, but that we have space time. So also the quantum theories, or more in particular, the quantum field theories that we have constructed that work on up to like 20 digits after the, the point uh, to, to make predictions in the LHC are consistent with this, with this uh, notion of, of that we live in a four dimensional space time. Okay. So it seems consistent. <laughs> it, see, it appears to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I would like to ask you uh, there is another problem uh, um, with quantum gravity, and, it's the, and it is the fact that. Um, that yeah, we want uh, to treat space time uh, as an independent uh, quantity. Yeah, an independent entity. Let's put it this way. Um, what is this problem? Uh, uh, also called as a space time background uh, independence. Uh, why do we want space time to be independent? Uh, where is it uh, that we treat space time uh, as a dependent uh, variable? Okay. So actually, background independence. It's another way of saying that we want the physics or the physical quantities that we predict to be independent of the coordinate choice that we make. So again, if I punch someone in the face, it's going to be independent of if he was like thinking about the world in, in, in Cartesian coordinates or in spherical coordinates. So that's what background independence means, that you can do transformations in your coordinates, but that the physics should remain the same. But of course, now the problem is that, well, but the coordinates are actually, well, the way that we describe space-time itself, right? So uh, uh, so what is, what is the structure that should be in the background or, or should we have any background structure to even be able to do predict physical predictions? So, uh, well, yeah, that, that's a problem of, of background independence. So some people think, and I think most of the community think that, uh, that the physics and the, the final uh, quantum theory of gravity or theory of everything that we have should be background independent. So that you should be able to, to just do these mathematical transformations to the theory and don't change the physics. But of course, that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, it could be that there is some fundamental structure in space time that we cannot change. Uh, that is not just a mathematical artifact. Uh, but again, most of the community uh, supports the other view. OK. And uh, what about instead, uh, now moving on to some more experimental related uh, <laughs> stuff, how can we probe, uh, let's say, the ethics? Uh, of quantum gravity at what 
scale do we need uh, to look to see these effects? Well, uh, the the natural scale for uh, well for quantum gravity is where we where everything breaks down, right? <laughs> So where, where I cannot do any predictions anymore. And this scale is called the Planck energy. So that's a scale where things that, well, when you try to quantize gravity, things that were small, they become very big. And then you get all of these, uh, a lot of, of, of interactions contributing to what you want to compute. So that's a natural scale of energy of, of quantum gravity. And it is pretty, pretty, pretty big. Like that's one of the main problems of quantum gravity that not even with the LHP in its best days, we could we could hope to to prove to arrive to the Planck scale. It is super, super big. So of course, a, a lot of people say, well, I mean, those are regimes that we will never be able to prove. They don't affect our our experiments because they are like in a very very uh, uh, energetic in a very energetic part of, of the spectrum. So, we should, why should we quantize gravity if it's not going to affect what we see every day? Uh, but actually, a lot of people have been uh, well for the last uh, century have been thinking about. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, that sounds very weird, right? Because quantum gravity has to do with the beginning of the universe. I mean, you can argue that in the interior of black holes, we will never see interior of so black holes, only what is outside. So maybe quantum gravity is not relevant, but, but quantum gravity has been there from the beginning of the universe. It was the first, uh, it, was, it was a predominant force or the predominant, uh, yeah, the predominant force at the beginning of the universe. So what people uh what some people are trying to do is to say okay i just have my preferred theory of quantum gravity i have this model that i like uh so let's see what happens at the beginning of the universe or very close to it and uh and let's see how the how the universe evolves and then we can compare what well the, the, your predictions with the actual data that we have we have a first image the first picture the, the picture of the oldest universe or well or, or the most baby universe that we can see that is called a uh, lambda cdm uh so we have a picture of, of some temperature profile of our universe that is super super old uh and then one can compare the predictions made with your favorite quantum gravity approach to what we see. And that's one way to test quantum gravity. And of course, another way to test it is that, well, remember that quantum, the quantum part of in quantum gravity comes from the fact that, well, we have these very small energetic particles in our universe that we're all made of. How do they interact gravitationally? So, even when you have an electron, an electron is very, very small. Uh, we cannot see it, but that electron has, of course, electric charge, but it also has mass. So in principle, if you put two electrons, if you were able to put two electrons, uh, one apart from another, they would feel like the, the Newtonian force, if you want that, that two particles uh, feel that attract them to each other. So. Also, some people are trying to, well, and, and they have actually managed to see how quantum particles, uh, well, how quantum particles interact gravitationally, and then if we can see some effects from quantum gravity there. But it remains uh, um, quite a, an open problem. <laughs> the experimental yes. probe uh, of quantum gravity effects. And now I would like to cover some uh, more, let's say, yeah, some hands, some, I would say, uh, some approaches that uh, got the hand dirty on the, the practical matter. And I would like to start uh, with uh, the highly debated uh, string theory. Uh, what is uh, this uh, string theory? And um, let's say, which problem does it solve and how does it do it? 
Yeah, so, uh, so string theory, I mean, it became very popular for a very good reason. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, independently on how people or how I even would feel about it. So we know that we have four fundamental forces or now that we, we have discussed about this, so we have actually four uh, like fundamental quantum field theories or four fundamental fields like the electric fields. We have the electromagnetic one. We have the, we have what is called, oh, sorry. Sorry, just a second. Yes, okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, so we have four fundamental forces for fundamental fields. So we have electromagnetic, uh, something that we call the strong uh, force, and we have the weak force, and then we have the gravitational force. And of course, uh, they, they look very different, like, <laughs> Gravity, we can see it in our everyday life. Like gravity looks very different from light. Like a thousand years ago or even 200 years ago, we could have never imagined that they were maybe very similar or that the mathematics behind them were very similar. And, uh, but then when, when I, well, when, when general relativity came and, and then uh, quantum theory came and then we started think about not space and time, but about space time, then we started formulating everything in, in, in a mathematical way that actually looks very similar. So one act actually can see the, the electromagnetic force as some curvature, but not in space time, but in this space of, of well, in this field that is the electromagnetic field. So, the mathematics started hinted on us that maybe there is, that there are very similar structures behind, behind these four forces, even if they look very, very different. And, uh, and then string theory was, was inspired by that. So in string theory, people started saying, well, can we formulate some theory that has the four forces in, in nature? as something that just emerges in different regimes of, so, of something fundamental. So, and what they came out with is that, well, it was actually, well, at, at least in principle, not very difficult. What one had to do was not to model like some particle moving in space time, but actually one had to model a, a string so something that is one dimensional, that's where it comes from. So instead of, of thinking about particles that are points, you should be thinking about one dimensional object. And if you write the equations for this one dimensional object and you quantize, again, quantize just the way that we quantize uh, electromagnetism, uh, then you get a, a huge, amount of particles with all the properties that you want. So you get a big zoo of different particles. And within those particles, you can identify, of course, up to some caveats. Uh, you can identify the matter that we see in the universe. You can identify a photon. You can identify some graviton. So when people did this, they that's why they got very excited, of course. I mean, you had managed to derive the four forces in the universe from just a string or a one dimensional object moving in some, uh, in some space, in some space time actually. But of course then people realize that, well, oh, actually you just said, you just talked about the dimension of space time. Well, actually this theory is only consistent if you are either in 26 dimensions so if your string is moving in 26 dimensions or the best, the best they could do is in 10 dimensions. So uh, that was a bit of a turn, uh, turn down for, for string theory, at least a lot of years ago. And also to make sense of this theory and to have uh, actually to have electrons, to have protons, to have 
uh, particles that we call fermions, you actually need another symmetry in the universe, which is called supersymmetry. And we haven't seen supersymmetry so far. We have done all of these experiments. Uh -huh. What is supersymmetry? Supersymmetry uh, is, uh, so it states that every particle in our universe has both uh, a fermion and a boson representation. What that means is that, for example, the photon, the photon is a boson. So then you would also need in the universe to, to, for a photino or for some fermion paired to the photon to exist. So this is gonna be, you can think about it as an electron. So there is another kind of electron. There's another kind of fermion that will have very, very similar properties to the photon, but well, it, it is not quite a photon. Uh, and of course, I mean, with the electrons, we can detect electrons in our universe. So if this photino, if this fermionic partner of the photon would exist, then we would have already seen it. Right. And this applies for every particle. So also the electron, the electron that is a fermion, it would have a boson partner, a boson How sibling. Huh? How is it called? The boson partner? Uh, for the electron, I think all of them are just called Eno at the end. So it would be the electrino. For the graviton, I know it's graviton and gravitino, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Yes. And instead, you mentioned before um, that we are having a string theory being consistent uh, at the very least uh, in ten dimension. Uh, um, what about instead the uh, M theory in eleven dimension? Uh, um, what is the difference uh, uh, between M theory and string theory? Is it, uh, are they subset uh, of each other? Well, so the first thing that I can tell you about this is that I think there's only a couple of people in the world that actually know what M theory is. Uh -huh. M theory is, uh, yeah, it's a very general term. It's, well, I would consider it a more abstract term than an actual theory. So what happens is that, uh, well, you have these one dimensional objects Springs that are moving, and uh, well, then it, they started discovering that well, there are actually bigger dimensional. So you can think about membranes and, and higher dimensional objects. So you can imagine that this gives rise to a very big family of of particles and theories. Like there are so many parameters in that theory that you actually have a very rich theory, much much richer than what we actually see in our universe. So there are not only four fundamental forces, but there are more, more forces, more fundamental forces in that theory. So there are a lot of things that you can change in the theory. And this led on to people saying, okay, I will, ask, I will make some assumptions about how the theory, I will fix some parameters so that I can make predictions. And this, this led to different kinds of string theories. So there is type one string theory, type 2B, type 2A string theory. So there are at least five. Five are the most uh, famous ones. Where people are saying, okay, I will assume that these are my degrees of freedom. These are my fundamental particles. And then I work, work with that because otherwise I would get an infinite number of different particles. Uh, so then, but of course, then people started doing predictions with this and then they were like, oh, but actually, I mean, we all started from string theory. So we should be able to communicate or to do some transformations to our theory so that we can actually map one theory into another one. And then uh, Edward Deaton, uh, one of the renowned names in, in string theory, he was able to formulate uh, another theory that contained all of these, at least these five string theories into a common ground, into a common description, but then he needed an extra dimension to do it. 
So just to parameterize this, this theory is as part of something. And it is, it is something common, right? So if you want to put things together, then you need at least one dimension more to put them together. Okay, okay. What do you think, uh, what is your opinion about string theory? Do you think uh, the hype uh, there has been uh, and the current is probably, uh, is it justified? Is it uh, close to being uh, the theory, the actual theory of quantum gravity? Or is it just an unjustified uh, excitement that there have been? Yeah, so uh, personally, when I was a student, I was super excited about string theory. String theory was the first thing that I started studying. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it arrives to a point where you say, well, I mean, why is our universe the way it is if, there, if this theory predicts like, a, well, there can be a lot of more particles than, than what, there, what we can measure in experiments. So I, well, I, I will make a strong claim. Like I don't think uh, string theory is the theory of quantum gravity. Well, I actually don't think that any of the theories that we have right now is the theory of quantum gravity, but I think that every, well, at least, well, string theory in particular has uh, taught us uh, a lot of things that will help us to quantize gravity at some point. Uh, in particular, well, string theory has led people to actually understand the role of dimension, the role of the that the dimension of space-time plays in in a lot of things, like in our predictions, in uh, in the way that black holes are. The so black holes are special in four dimensions. In two dimensions, they are very different. So it has led us to explore a, a very big part of well of ideas that that we haven't even thought about it before before string theory. And uh, and in particular, there's also this part called holography or ADSCFT that came from from string theory that it's a conjecture, uh, but it has led us also to, to think about, uh, well, a lot of ideas in a very different way. Okay, how do we, how do we test uh, string theory? So how do we experimentally validate uh, a theory like string theory? Well, uh, that's also debatable, but uh, personally, I can tell you like, if uh, one of the first things that you would need to prove at least string theory as it is nowadays, is uh, you would need to find supersymmetry. <laughs> and that means you should be able to find the photino or the electrino or all of these partners of the particles that we have in our universe. And we haven't. So that's one of the things. Uh, another thing would be to, well, to actually measure these extra dimensions. So uh, the way that uh, people have been going around these extra dimensions is saying, oh, okay, maybe, I mean, what can, one can think that these dimensions are there, but they are actually very small. So, uh, so we actually feel, or we, every day in our lives, we feel like there are four dimensions, three of space and one of time, but there are actually other dimensions, but they are hidden because they are just very, very small. Uh, so of course, measuring these, some, some imprint of these extra dimensions would also support uh, string theory. But we haven't uh, found any like particular measurements of any of these two. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's uh, sometimes quite funny to see the heat uh, that uh, string theory speckles when there are some, uh, let's say, debate or talks uh, uh, among physicists uh, and um, yeah, it's I mean funny let's say quote unquote uh, to see the um, physicists being so split uh, on a uh, string theory but I guess we will still have to wait uh, some time I, I would like now to ask you about uh, mm -hmm. other quite promising uh, let's say theory of uh, quantum gravity which is uh, loop quantum gravity which has been uh, uh, developed uh, and uh, yeah improved by uh, also by among many 
by Carlo Rovelli, a very Italian uh, famous uh, physicist. What is uh, this uh, loop quantum gravity? Again, uh, same question. What problems does it solve uh, and in what way? Well, so in loop quantum gravity, one starts from a very different point of view. So for string theory, you want it to unify or to see all of the physics that we see in our universe as to, to just one description. And for that, that's why you needed to add this, well, move from particles to strings. For loop quantum gravity, one doesn't have that philosophy. One thinks, okay, I, I want to uh, quantize gravity. Uh, so I, I, I believe in general relativity. I believe that gravity is described in the way that we have it right now. Uh, it's just in quantum theory is also correct. We don't need to add, add anything extra, but we were just not right in the way that we were trying to quantize gravity. So it was not the best way to think about gravity again as a field, like the electromagnetic field and start uh, quantizing it as a quantum field theory. But we, actually the procedure, well, that was just, we were led by the wrong ideas. So in, in, uh, in loop quantum gravity, one does something called canonical quantization. So this is another way of quantizing a theory, which at the end of the day should be equivalent to, to any other form of quantizing the theory. Uh, so then people took general relativity in starting this procedure canonical quantization. And then what they arrive to is that, well, you actually have a, a structure that is pretty similar to any other system that we have tried to quantize. Yes, uh, again, another change of location. Uh, we <laughs> like surprises. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, so then one applies this, this quantization procedure to gravity, to general relativity, without adding any extra ingredients, without adding no more dimensions, without adding more particles, you don't add anything. And uh, then one finds that you actually have a, a, a quantum mechanical system that looks very similar to to a particle, a quantum particle system, in the sense that if one has, uh, well, if one, if one increases the energy of the system, then one can get, uh, produce, one can produce particles. Okay. So, but instead of particles, what one produces are, well, quanta, this fundamental. Uh, thing so one produces quanta, but uh, but of, of space time itself. So you can think about it as having uh, well starting your base system is just a cube or a tetrahedra, and then when you increase the energy, you will create more and more tetrahedra. So uh, this is uh, this is like constructing a picture from pixels. So. The idea would be that when one quantizes gravity, one is actually quantizing space-time itself. We shouldn't be surprised about, well, space-time becoming actually discrete, having some resolution, some minimal resolution, yeah. and, uh, and then be able to, to, to get our everyday life from, from, from some low energy limit of this uh, of this constructive space time. Okay, what are called uh, the, uh, let's say, minimal, uh, yeah, the fundamental chunks of space time. What's, what's the name, what are, how, what are they called? Uh, just quanta of space time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These systems always are very much original uh, when uh, attributing names, okay. That's, yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> yes, they don't have any particular uh, name. And I have to say that, uh, Remember that when we started talking about why gravity is non-renormalizable, why gravity is unpredictive, the problem was that, well, as you go higher in energy, you have to add more and more interactions, right? And more and more terms. And 
in in loop quantum gravity, one actually gets rid of that problem because then you have a fundamental length, right? So you have some some scale where you cannot go further. So if you think about a fundamental tetrahedra, a fundamental cube of space time, and you call this length, well, you, you have you have that fixed length uh, of one of its sides or the basic volume of space time, then one cannot go deeper into that volume. That that's a fundamental volume. So there is a what it's called a UV cutoff, or there is some some maximum energy that one can access. And that's how you solve the problem of, of non-renormalizability or of gravity. Okay. So you cannot go to higher energy. Well, or you won't see anything if you want to go to higher energies because that's the minimal resolution. Okay, okay. I think the, the image uh, you gave uh, with um, uh, the pixels uh, and composing a picture out of it uh, was actually very clear. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, very quite explanatory. Um, but now I would ask you again uh, here: what, how do we, how do we test the loop quantum gravity? Because uh, it looks uh, a cool theory. Many physicists uh, are working on it. How do we validate uh, this theory? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, in my personal view, it is even more difficult because uh, I mean. The first idea that can come to our minds is that, okay, well, let's just measure or see this quantum space time, right? Let's just uh, go hi to higher and higher energy so that we can see this quantum space time and that cutoff or that minimal length, that minimal volume that we can access. Uh, and, and well, that's, that's super high energy. So that's again going to uh, the, the, en the Planck energy regime. So it, that is not accessible through our, our, um, well, our experiments right now. Uh, another way that people have been trying to, to, to bring loop quantum gravity to the real world is again by, by starting uh, the universe by trying to make predictions. So there is this, uh, this subfield of loop quantum gravity called loop quantum cosmology, when, where one actually uh, thinks about models the universe, thinking about this, uh, it being constructed from these from this basic cubes or this minimal volume quantum of space time, and making predictions for, for what we would see nowadays. I think that's a common ground for every quantum gravity approach because every quantum gravity approach needs a lot, a lot of energy to be fundamentally proven. So the best that we can do is always, okay, I take my favorite one. I imagine that it's applicable to the beginning of the universe or very close to it. I evolve it and then I see what it gives me and I compare with observation. Okay. Okay. Maybe. I think we may uh, we may reserve uh, the pleasure to discuss some other theories uh, of quantum gravity and uh, actually more into the detail uh, string theory, both string theory and loop quantum gravity. Because now I would like to um, ask you some more, let's say, general question uh, okay. regarding uh, yeah, physics uh, in general. And the f first of all, I would like to ask you uh, whether you believe uh, uh, if math is uh, invented or discovered and why? Matter. Sorry, math, mathematics. Oh, mathematics. Yep. Uh, okay, so yeah, that, that's very deep. <laughs> so, my personal view is that mathematics is, I mean, is both in some, in some sense because Mathematics, we came out with mathematics. So we wrote what the numbers are, we wrote all of these theorems and then, well, these rules, and then we can prove theorems and construct things on top of yeah. that, right? But mathematics didn't come out from, I don't know, randomly from, from humanity, right? We yeah. were looking at the universe. We were seeing how stars were moving. We were seeing that uh, thing, well, that time, that time 
access that we can uh, we can predict the future. If I throw a ball, I can predict where that's gonna fall. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. So in that sense, it it it's coming from nature, but uh, but yeah. But we created it in our minds. Okay, and. What is, according to you, the most uh, the most beautiful concept uh, in physics? The most beautiful what? The most beautiful concept uh, in physics. Concept. Concept. Or, or theory, or uh, yeah, whatever you like the most in physics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I I do quantum gravity. I love quantum gravity. So. Uh, is it very loud, the, the wind? Oh, no, it's okay. No, it's okay? Okay. So, well, we're in the Netherlands, right? So <laughs> this is part of the interview always. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I am very, very fascinated by the concept of space time. I am not willing to give up the concept of space time yet. <laughs> the fact that, that the, the, the equations and the, the, well, the observations led us to understand that even though space and time look very different for us in our everyday life, actually they can be unified and they can be uh, conceptualized in something that, well, that, that has some common nature. And another one of them very related against space time and to quantum gravity is causality. Okay. Causality means that, well, uh, I can break a glass uh, of wine, uh, but I cannot revert that, right? <laughs> like uh, me throwing the glass is what led for, for it to be broken there. And that's what led for now me uh, trying to pick it up and cutting my hand, and I cannot reverse that. So causality and the direction of time, uh, that's also very, very fascinating to me. Uh, and, and yeah, I think that's one of the most fundamental problems, like uh, to understand why things are that way, right? I mean, there should be a reason. I, I am hoping that quantum gravity can also tell us that, like, why is that this causal uh, structure in our universe the way it is? Okay. Why can't we go back in time? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Yeah, probably the easiest answer to give uh, for the, this question is because we would break causality. <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> that's probably in the straightest the most straightforward answer and the last question i would like to ask you is uh, um sometimes people uh um what i mean i hear talks uh, or discussion about um um okay why there has been uh, this maybe more uh, on the philosophical side but why there has been a big bang why there has been a space time as well uh, all of these whys but to me, um, I like uh, generally with a question like this uh, to go even uh, to go at least to the more fundamental uh, and deepest level that I can uh, I can find uh, for this question. And I understood that uh, the question uh, for sure is going to be um, for, for for sure a question can be why there has been the Big Bang, why the uh, space time has emerged. But first of all, my question uh, that I bring even into much smaller terms uh, is. Uh, why, first of all, there are uh, dimension? Because uh, dimensions are, uh, by definition, uh, the medium through which uh, things can happen, be observed, be described. And uh, when I pose uh, myself this question, or at least I try to wrap my head around uh, uh, this question, uh, I can't help it uh, other than, uh, um, let's say, thinking uh, that our space-time uh, manifold uh, that we can see, so our observable universe, uh, is actually pretty arbitrary. There is not mm -hmm. a particular reason why we got uh, for dimension. There is not a particular reason why, um, where we cannot see, there can't be five uh, or 10 uh, or 20 or whatever. I don't really see a reason, which is also why I found myself very much uh, in contrast uh, with the view of the multiverse, uh, which predicts that uh, all the chunks uh, of the universe that we cannot see, they are all four dimensional space. Because to me, this is uh, a completely unjustified assumption or uh, conclusion. Yeah. And the thing is that uh, when I reason about uh, this question, uh, 
of course, uh, one thing which, let's say, is very much um, significant uh, is uh, the arbitrariness uh, of this all. And uh, for... I want to ask you, I want to ask you, um, do you think, uh, is, there a, is there a meaning uh, to all of this uh, when you try to uh, understand uh, the most cutting edge uh, mathematics, uh, uh, mathematical models uh, to describe uh, what happens uh, in those places uh, of space time uh, where we have no, absolutely no clue what happens? Uh, what what do you what feelings do you have does does this have a meaning do you how, how do you say yeah do you think uh this has had a purpose or was it just yeah cha- i would say the product of something much more arbitrary than what we can actually understand yeah so I, I first I want to say that this is a completely valid question, and and that's question. I mean, right now during this conference in quantum gravity, we are discussing about this, you know, because we don't have an answer for for most of this. So uh, this actually also goes very related to my 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 research. So I do random geometry. That means considering all the possible spaces, all the possible space times, and 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 in this. Uh, spaces dimension is not something unique so so you can have different dimensions at different scales so uh, this means that for example well, this is a very typical uh, example so imagine you're well we can actually do it with ourselves right so we are humans and we walk on earth but of course if you only work walk in your neighborhood you would think that we only have uh well, that we live in a flat neighborhood, right? Like that's why there are still people that are flat earthers. So uh, we could think that our our universe, well, or our Earth is actually flat. But then when one goes to bigger scales, or what actually starts doing very precise measurements, one realizes that there's actually some curvature, and that we are actually on a sphere or something very similar to a sphere. So, uh, well, the concept of geometry and where in which geometry we live in the universe, it's, it, it could be that we're completely wrong about it. Uh, but first I want to say that we don't know, we don't have a concrete answer on why we live in four dimensions or why we think that we live in four dimensions, why, why we see three dimensions of space in one of time. But one can go to a, a more uh, experimental approach. Right, so one can ask, okay, what do we see uh, in experiments that can lead us to to understand better if our universe is actually four dimensional or if we should be looking for something else? And something very that I find very fascinating is that when you study fundamental particles in in well, in a space-time, in a, space time, in, a fi- in a fixed space-time, let's not even think about quantum gravity, but in just in, in space-time, the dimension of space-time sometimes determines if these particles are stable or not. So it could be that if we lived in smaller or higher dimensions, then we wouldn't see photons or we wouldn't, well, it's more for massive particles. So we wouldn't see the same mass of the electron. We wouldn't see protons. We wouldn't see the matter that we see around us. So that's a very strong indication that at least these particles think that they are living in four dimensions. Uh, But of course, this is up to the experiments we can do in the universe that we can see. So we don't know, and of course, that's tied to the energies that we can access through these experiments. So we don't have a definitive answer of in which dimension we actually live. What we can say is that the observations that we do nowadays, most of the observations we do nowadays, they are telling us that we live in four dimensions. And then one could, I mean, then one could go in a very anthropocentric point of view, right? That, well, if we didn't live in four dimensions, we would actually not be here to make this question. 
So that that the, the, the existence of our of us and of matter, well not let's not go with people, but just of matter, of the matter that we see around and the forces that we see around are actually these are the forces and the particles that we see because we live in four dimensions. That's the proof that we live in four dimensions. But uh but yeah, but this is not unique. I mean, that's why also string theory is not dead, right? Because there are still ways to have higher dimensional theories or think that we are living in a higher dimensional universe and that actually just effectively that in our day-to-day -day life, we just see four dimensions because, well, we're tied to very low energies. So, uh, yeah, but, but yeah, but, I want to say that, I mean, one of my dreams, my hopes is that one day we can actually answer this question. Why is our universe four dimensional? Is it, is it such a special point? Is it four, is it so, so special that if we lived in five, well, then we wouldn't be alive. You wouldn't live, there would be no universe. And if, if, if the universe had chosen three, then I don't know the Big Bang had never happened. Why is it for? Oh. Are you okay. still there? Yes, sir. I, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I <laughs> for a second then. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, it's very, I think it's very, I'd say, uh, <laughs> challenging uh, or, um, yeah, exciting also to, try to wrap oneself around uh, oneself around uh, this kind of concept but i think it's a it's a nice uh, it's a nice hobby it's a nice entertainment uh, <laughs> free time well, yeah i hope it still gave us the jobs for some time but but hopefully one day we will be able to stop it okay so i think we can uh, we can wrap it up uh, here alicia thank you thank you very much for your time and your explanation it was a uh, very interesting to hear from you and uh, good luck for the uh, for continuing uh, the um, conference and um, hopefully we will be able to meet again and maybe discuss in more details uh, other theories uh, of quantum gravity and uh, why not maybe some uh, further advances that uh, yourself may have brought up in the field yeah, sure. And I, I hope that uh, during this conference, we can uh, get a bit closer to answering these questions. That it, these are the same questions that, that we are asking ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Alicia. And um, thank you. thanks everyone uh, for uh, following along with us. This was uh, the mathematical uh, beauty. And I will see you in the next uh, episode. Bye.